forget all you know about podcasts. We welcome you to an experience uniquely different. Please join us for our coverage of all entertainment on the fringe of society. The candles are lit. The lights are down low. It is now time to welcome our host. As he steps up to the pulpit, the sacrifice has been prepared for the midnight. For the midnight. Black. Galaxy greetings, groovy ghoulies, and welcome to another edition, Volume 6, Episode 27, to be precise, of the Midnight Black Mass Podcast. It's better than a kick in the balls. I am your host, the <laughs> Reverend Dan Wilson, alongside my tag team partner, the Southeastern Strangler, Andrew Alexander. And we are just a mere days away from Star Wars The Force Awakens. I'm a little bit excited. I'm a lot of bit excited, but we need to go back to something. There's probably some listeners out there that disagree that this is not better than a kick to the balls because some guys are into that, you know, maybe have a chick stand on them with their high heels, you know, stretch them out, maybe put some clothespins on them. Just a lot of abuse going on. People are into that shit. Yeah, they they made a movie about it, don't you know? (laughs) What's the movie called? (laughs) <laughs> I, I heard it was that there uh, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, I I don't know yeah. about Fifty Shades of Grey because I watch pornography, so I didn't need to pay fifteen dollars to go to the theaters to see a watered down version of it. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, or as a, as a dear friend of both of ours who shall remain nameless once said. About Fifty Shades of Grey. What the fuck is that? That's a Tuesday night. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, uh, That's a good point. And I believe uh, believe the romance in pornography more than I believe the romance in that movie. Good possibility. Well, of course, last week, folks, we left you with our Star Wars tribute, the first part of of hopefully many parts. Uh, It it was released to great acclaim, the first ever Super Star Wars, as part of our grand excitement for Star Wars The Force Awakens. Everybody's getting their tickets. I'm scoping out my show times. Still a few. Those events, uh, the first night's going to be totally sold out by the time next Thursday rolls around. Luckily, I'm buying my tickets tomorrow. But, um, yeah, there's they're few and far between. Lots of screens already completely sold out. Yeah, I def- there were some times when I was looking at tickets that uh, they didn't have any available. So, yeah, the buzz is huge. Uh, I wouldn't doubt to see it become the, uh, the number one biggest opening of all time. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised by that at all. Uh, it's a phenomenon. Yeah, it definitely is, and there, I'm excited. I'm pumped. There's a Force Awakening, and it's in my pants. I'm that excited. Me too. My lightsaber is a fresh Kyber <laughs> crystal, and it is fully lit for Star Wars: The Force Awakens. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so, so, I just in the spirit of Star Wars, before we get to the wrestling news here, I just wanted to talk about this because I was, you know, getting caught up on the old Netflix, and I've watched it before in its entirety, but this time I really sat down with a fine tooth comb and watched it, especially because the the Star Wars prequels are infamously pretty well garbage. Uh, not that there's not some cool stuff in them, uh, but you know, the the main plot really doesn't work so well, but. Star Wars The Clone Wars, an animated series which takes place, and is official canon still, takes place in between episodes two and three. Five seasons worth of animated television. It's all on Netflix, Netflix, folks. Uh, Go check it out. Kicks off with a two-hour movie. It's on there as well. 
and then you got five seasons of one of the best animated series ever produced. Uh, maybe since Batman the Animated Series, it, it's right up there in that elite tier of animated series, and it's so good that it almost washes the taste of those other films out of your mouth. Notice I said almost, because, of course, it is about all of those characters. But you see in the greatness of that fucking show that the characters were not the problem in that movie or in any of those movies. It it was not the characters because they cracked the nut, so to speak, in The Force Awakens. They, they, Not The Force Awakens, The Clone Wars. They figure it out. Uh, it, It really tells some deep stories that makes you care about everybody involved. That's awesome. So, uh, what would you? What do you think? The, what do you think the big problem was in those prequels? If you had to boil it down to one or two things, how long you got, good buddy? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they they were like, especially if you watch them in order, as it was intended by the visionary George Lucas, uh, one through six. It makes the whole story a convoluted fucking mess. The original trilogy was this brilliant piece of work, and there was a lot of mystery about what happened before. In the prequels, when they did it, it almost was a letdown. Uh, The action was very good, though the CGI, a bit primitive for its time, does not hold up very well now uh, because it was in the early days of CGI. So that's a problem. And then also, uh, like, the main story between Anakin Skywalker and Padme was fucking terribly acted, and the dialogue was terribly written. And while the fucking fight sequences were goddamn awesome, like Darth Maul versus Qui-Gon Jinn in episode one is fucking badass, the big fight at the end where Qui-Gon gets killed, spoiler alert, and uh, fucking <laughs> uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, has to, to kill Darth Maul, essentially. Like, that's all badass. Like, Ewan McGregor was badass as Obi-Wan Kenobi, uh, but it's just they did not have the same heart and soul. And I think a big problem with that is George Lucas wrote and directed those movies, whereas he only wrote and directed the original Star Wars A New Hope movie originally. The greater uh, Empire Strikes Back, which is considered the crowning achievement of Star Wars canon, was written by Lawrence Kasdan, uh, who is coming back to consult and co-write The Force Awakens with uh, J.J. Abrams, of course. So uh, very excited to have him back on board. I think George Lucas just kind of fell out of love with the franchise and didn't give a fuck what fan service wanted. He just wanted to do what he was going to do. And like it had kind of gotten so far out of his hands and the size and the scope and the love that, that Star Wars had created. I just don't think he handled it. Like He did an interview a few weeks ago talking about how he was so hurt and crushed by the reaction to Jar Jar Binks because he was actually his favorite character that he ever created. <laughs> wow. Favorite character ever. So, so yeah. it sounds like George Lucas sounds a lot like Vince McMahon. <laughs> Maybe a little out of touch. That's what some people are saying. <laughs> Certainly <laughs> what some people are saying. And Maybe that's a good segue for the Wrestle News. Beep, 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 beep. Time for the Wrestle News. Uh, boy, WWE, I feel sorry for them <laughs> to a degree because well, they're getting let, fucking hammered. Let's start off with a good piece of Wrestle News that oh, I okay, well, you dropped the segue. <laughs> I was just running with it, pal. Oh, I mean, oh yeah, it's, it's a great segue. But I just, I just think the most important thing to come out of the professional wrestling world this week, still early in the week as we record this, but. On Monday Night Raw, yes, the flagship program of the entire professional wrestling industry, Tommy Dreamer scored a pinfall after using a DDT. It was crazy. (laughs) It was fucking nuts. Well, Tommy's a, a hell of a talent, you know, always has been, in my opinion, and he's just one of those tried and true guys. Like, they never seem to want to do anything with him, but they always call on him when they need somebody for a spot like that. Yeah, he's definitely, I mean, he's, I guess he's what you describe as a good hand, and they definitely didn't never wanted to uh, 
go too far with him, but just, I mean, when I saw that, uh, I know we're going to talk about Raw and some other things, but I was just like, holy shit, a DDT just picked up a victory. And then, uh, and then later, or later in that same match, Alberto Del Rio nailed a super kick that I was like, "Oh, that might be the finish," but it wasn't. <laughs> oh, wow! <laughs> fucking surprise! Slap my ass and called me a fucking uncle. <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> okay, so on to your wrestle news. It's all downhill for me. Yeah. Apparently, uh, yeah, poor WWE. They're just getting hammered by the critics and the fans, and it's not like it was back in the day. Um, you know, now that they've achieved such a status, you know, they used to be the only people bitching were wrestling fans on the Internet. Well, those wrestling fans have grown up and gotten jobs and become editors and writers for major mainstream publications. And so now uh, WWE, with their record low ratings recently, are really taking a beating in the press. And, um, you know, the fans are just at their throat that it's stale and they want something new. I've not been watching Raw much week to week. I usually watch the pay-per-views. I try not to be too critical because it's just more than I care to invest myself in. You know, it's like I've got no skin in the game. So it's like I want to watch and be entertained, but I just don't follow week to week as much as I used to or probably should in some cases. And, you know, it's not that I won't watch Raw from time to time, but um, this is just, you know, the the buzz that I'm picking up off the Internet, and it is not good for those guys. The buzz on the indicator. <laughs> um, I actually just finished uh, a, a few minutes ago watching Raw from this week, um, the Hulu version, and, I mean, it wasn't that bad, the, the last segment did go on for what uh, started to seem like forever. Uh, It wasn't the worst show I've seen this year by any means, but yeah, they're just getting just nailed uh, constantly with with pretty much everyone with an opinion, uh, which is everyone. Uh, Yeah, including like former stars, which is kind of rough because... There used to be a time when guys wouldn't speak out because they, you know, wanted to go back. But now it just seems, you know, it's social media time. Nobody gives a fuck. I mean, it had a, a unique start, and they did this big, huge, like, four-corner, 16-man tag match elimination shit with, like, all the like the, the ECW rebranded thing they have going. They brought back Rhino, and he, had a, he got a nice little reception, and uh, Roman Reigns and the Babyface Crew with the League of Nations and the Wyatt Family, and I mean it was it was different. It was, uh, you know, something I've never seen done before, not in that that exact style. And, and I mean, there were some fine segments. Um, I still, I just honestly think what it boils down to the the only the biggest problem they have right now it's it's not content and it's not lighting and angles and stars it's not those things it's the fact that three hours is too much that's the num that's the issue that's the number one thing we love okay okay we love we're excited about star wars the force awakens going to be huge going to be epic i bet it's almost a three-hour movie what if next week they did another one and then the next week they did another one and then the next week, they did another one. Every Monday, you have a new Star Wars movie come out. Eventually, you're going to be like, well, I don't know. These are kind of getting a little stale. It's three hours every week. It's too fucking much. That's, and that's you're, the bottom you're, line here. Yeah, and you're competing with Monday Night Football, Gotham, Supergirl, several other blockbuster television shows in those time slots that are right around there. So exactly. um, you, not only you've got three hours worth of content that, and that's a lot of time to expect people to give up every week for one show when you're competing with so many great television programs and what many are calling the golden age of television right now for dramas, action series, etc. So, 
a tough spot for them to be in. They serve a lot of masters. They're still a profitable company, still making a lot of money. They've yeah. got a lot of overseas deals. So, you know, they're they're not hurting really in the box office, it would appear. But I think uh, is it a case where things have gone too far in the direction of the fans having a voice? Like I said once before on the show, they gave them the gun. They handed them the gun and said, here, what do you think? And now they're telling them, and they kind of don't know what to do. And so it's like, do you listen to that opinion? Do you just press forward? I, I mean, personal opinion, and I, I don't ever like to talk shit about WWE, uh, but I do think like the set could stand to be refreshed, and some of the presentation of the show could stand to be refreshed a little bit. Um, but I, I think the biggest thing that guys talk about as far as like the old timers that comment on it, uh, they really do need to let guys kind of go out more a little unhinged. The the overscripting is hurting them, I believe, and, and it's finally starting to catch up to them. Yeah, and I definitely agree with that. But, you know, going back to what you said about, you know, they, they serve a lot of masters. It, yeah, it boils down to they're, they're still like the highest rated show on USA. Uh, it has to be, if not the highest up there, but I'm sure it's the highest. Uh and USA is paying for this programming. They want the three hours. Now, if Blog Talk Radio comes to you and says, okay, we can do the Midnight Black Mass for two hours a week. We'll pay you half a million dollars. Or we'll pay you three-quarter of a million dollars for three hours of content. By God, every fucking week, me and you are going to be sitting out here for an extra hour fucking farting on snare drums if we have to to fill that time because we're fucking getting paid we're not going to say oh no we can't do an extra hour of content because it would ruin our integrity and our our artistic freedom couldn't shine through but fuck that noise we were going to be like fuck yeah we'll be giving you an extra hour and it don't matter what we're what we're doing we'll i mean i'll start going out fucking midgets and shit so we'll have shit to talk about uh and I mean that's what they have, but I just I, they got to find a different way to fill that time. And my theory is, I thought they should. I think they should do from eight to nine. They should just do their NXT show that comes on weekly on uh, the WWE Network. At least try it. If it doesn't work, you can always go back and do something else. But it, it gives variety, and I think there's going to be people that don't watch Raw that would like to watch that, or people that. Maybe don't want that. Don't even know about NXT. Maybe because uh, there still has to be some people that have never checked it out. I know it's the hot thing right now, but there there still has to be people that haven't that aren't watching it. And you know, I like NXT a lot, and I think they do a great job. But I think people, I think people may be forgetting things about how you know because the crowds are always really hot and they're really into stuff and they just bite on everything. But you have to think that. A lot of that crowd is like the same crowd of diehard wrestling and NXT fans. And also, they go to a show once a month, roughly. I don't know the exact schedule. But they go to a show once a month, and they see four weeks of television taped, and it's like all the best stuff. You get to see everybody, and anything that's going to happen for that month of television is going to happen in front of that crowd. So they're going to see the best stuff. They're not going to miss out on anything. So yeah, they're they're hotter. I don't know if that's always going to convey. If if uh, if all the NXT stuff was done the exact same way on Raw, I don't I don't know that that would necessarily be the answer. It's not a bad attempt. It would it would be a great thing to try, but I don't know if that's just automatically going to be like the saving grace. Because a lot of people are comparing the products now and thinking, why is NXT so good and so fresh and so unique while Raw is just this stale product that's been going the same exact way, if that makes any sense. Yeah, oh no, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so I I just wonder what's going to happen. I know they're pissed off about it. I know that there's changes coming, I'm sure. What kind of changes, we'll see. Uh, you know, more power to them, I always say. WWE is the industry leader. Um, the business lives and dies by their success. So if they're perceived as uncool or 
unhip, then the shit rolls downhill, and it's not good for any of us. So you should all be rooting for the WWE success, uh, and hopefully they can turn the ship around. You know, they've they've done it plenty of times before, so I have no doubt. Um, I think this this is a longer period. Uh, Vince McMahon's a guy who thrives on competition, and he hasn't had any in a long fucking time. And I think the NXT thing has kind of shined a spotlight on some of the weaknesses of the big brand's product because they do just kind of present it as a traditional wrestling show. And this, that large section of the fans who's kind of been clamoring for that to come back is satiated by that. So they, they have something to compare it to now. And I, I don't think that they necessarily like that NXT has so much positive buzz over the main brand when it's supposed to be the AAA or the feeder system to the WWE. So I, I think changes are coming and uh, should be interesting to see what they do. Uh, you know, are we going to see something similar to another Attitude Era that spawns out of this? It, it's possible. It, it was during the low business times of the mid-90s that their most profitable and popular period of all time spawned out of. So, you know, uh, w- when the chips fall, so to speak, and things are looking down, Vince McMahon is notorious and legendary for being able to pull one out. And, you know, they say he's out of touch. They say he's old. Uh, I mean, he is old. <laughs> you can't deny that. But uh, they, they say he's out of touch. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe that's true. But they've counted him out a lot of times before, and he's always managed to be successful. That's something I wanted to bring up, the attitude there, because that's something that people always go back to because that was the biggest the biggest point in professional wrestling history, even though it wasn't just the attitude era, it was also, you know, the competition and the WCW and NWO and, and a lot of those things. But I just don't know if the same people that are clamoring for more wrestling, surely to God cannot be the same people wanting that attitude era, because I don't care what anybody says that the in-ring product back then does not hold up. There, I mean, there oh, are some good matches, but they're few and far between. Back then, the matches and everything, they're atrocious. Like, they're not good. And it's not the talent. It's just the style of the times and the the, the shorter matches. And it was all hardcore and fucking nut shots and less psychology and stuff like that. Like, I would rather watch matches with guys now than guys that are clear, clearly I would consider better workers from back then. Like, man, I don't, I don't know. There was just a lot of, there was a lot of Austin rock, triple H undertaker. These, these guys were in matches back then that I do not remember positively. Uh, you know, the, some of the pay-per-views were different and, you know, occasionally you would get, some some good matches, but for the most part, you see better matches now uh, and better in ring stuff. Even though a lot of times psychology is thrown out the window in different ways now, and there's just not a lot of selling and stuff like that. But I I, I would rather watch a lot of the guys now than stuff that was happening in the Attitude Era. There were better moments. There were cooler spots and funnier shit, and you know Austin running over shit with monster trucks and DX invading WCW and all of those things were really awesome. But the the in-ring product, the wrestling was not better. The ideal scenario is a balance between both. Um, The attitude area was very heavy on the connecting with the people and you got to do that. And of course the millions of dollars those people involved made will tell you that that was uh, certainly the way to go. However, to keep it pure and traditional to wrestling, you do still have to have plenty of wrestling. So you need to strike a nice balance where you have people super hot over the best wrestlers fighting for the top prize, you know. And if you can achieve that magic level of greatness, uh, which has not been done a lot of times in the wrestling business. I mean, let's be honest, uh, you know, looking at like maybe 89 NWA with Flair and Steamboat, uh, some of the late 70s NWA stuff. I mean, there was certainly a time where that was the case. But it's it's not always the case, you know. Uh, but that that's certainly where you would achieve that sweet spot, so to speak. Yeah, I, I think they're getting the. I don't know. It's like maybe they focus. They want to put all their eggs in one basket. And they don't want to 
spread out certain things, and and then they just get they get on these trips where they just do. do. I was listening to commentary and uh, Byron Saxton, I, I believe he, he does the the color now on Raw, and they took Jerry Lawler, moved him to SmackDown. You know, supposedly because he was too old, and when he's on camera, you can tell he's older. And that's not the demographic they're going for. That's the biggest load of horse shit I've ever heard in my life. Like, what wrestling fan is sitting there going, oh, this Byron Saxton kid, he's much better than Jerry Lawler at this job. That's, no, that's fucking stupid. Like, I if you do were building wonder. Up, go ahead. Yeah, I, I wonder about some of the, the practices when it comes to that. And I, I believe that mainly in the Kevin Dunn department. But, like, you have Jim Ross active, still wants to call matches, but they don't want to put him on TV. You know, he was bitter all the way to the end about being taken off of television. And, not, you know, you could tell that he was he was not happy about that. And he, he still wanted to do it. And he comes back, he does a kick-ass job on this new Japan. Like, as long as Jim Ross is able to deliver great performances, you should let Jim Ross deliver great performances. I don't see what logical reason anyone has to argue against that. Yeah, it's it's fucking stupid. Oh, and oh, it's like oh, he has a uh, an obvious uh, a handicap. Well, how many people in the fucking country that watch your programming have a handicap? They can relate to that. Not everyone has to be this fucking beautiful human being. When you know how much how much camera time did those announcers even get? Probably five minutes throughout the whole show. You just hear them. You got the you know you got the greatest commentator of all time and one of the greatest color commentators they would you know together as a team they're what many would consider the best announced team ever and you don't want to use them because they're they're not young they're not hip well young and hip ain't fucking working for them if you ask me the biggest rating (laughs) spikes they seem to get is when they have you know, it, 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 legends when they when they'll bring out a, a Shawn Michaels or a Bret Hart or a Rock or Austin maybe when Taker comes back, uh, Ric Flair. These guys, people get excited about that. That should tell them something. Yeah, it's a bad sign when nostalgia is more popular than what you're doing today. You know, again, that's something else you want to try to achieve a sweet spot on. You want the nostalgia to be important and be able to try it out. When it's when it means something and it's special, uh, but you know people don't need to be sitting around waiting on it. <laughs> you know that's that's not the way that's supposed to work. And you look on the network, you know they put all those old shows on there, and my God, that Mid South Wrestling stuff that's on there is so fucking good. I've seen most all of that, uh, but to have the TV in that fairly good order with that great quality and just the detail that Bill Watts put into selling those angles. Um, I hope their writing team is watching that because, yeah, it was 1985 and it was it, it was relevant to that. But you could take so many small things that they did and apply them today, and they still work like a fucking charm. Uh, I listened to um, Jim Ross had Kevin Sullivan on. Um, it's actually a two part or second part went up today, I believe. But you know, he said something interesting. He just said that. Why is there no one on the creative team just there as, like, quality control? Why don't they have somebody, a wrestling person, to sit in and to hear hear some ideas and say, well, wait a minute, here's why you can't do this particular one, because it's stupid fucking horseshit. Or this is why you can't have guys doing this in the match, because it's stupid horseshit. Just something to... Yeah, I mean, they, I question. think they definitely need some wrestling people on the, the creative uh, end of things. There, there's a lot of little tweaks, but I, I still, I still think it boils down to just a lot of it's a lot of product. It's a lot of time you're asking people to invest, and if you're not giving them awesome shit, they're not. You know, all these awesome epic shows, they're an hour every week. Uh, occasionally, there's a special thing where it's a two hour. But for the most part, they're one-hour shows. If you're having a DVR and you're skipping commercials, they're 42 minutes. 42 minutes and three hours, it's a big its a big difference. Yeah, extremely big. 
So, like I, like I said before, all the best to them. Hopefully they, they turn the ship around. Uh, you know, it's good for all of us. So the only other thing <laughs> that I wanted to address on the Wrestle News was uh, a viral video that went all over the world this week in reference to wrestling. Uh, it was involving any wrestler from California, Joey Ryan, and a Japanese wrestler, I believe it was, from Japan. Uh, it was a spot where the guy grabs his dick, and he doesn't sell it. And he doesn't sell it, and then he wrestles around with his dick, and his dick, like, suplexes the guy, essentially. Like, oh, ha-ha, I get it, you know. And and good good for him. It got a lot of play all over the place, and, you know, he got got on all of the clip shows and this, that, and the other, uh, you know. And there's certainly a market for that, and there's certainly an audience that likes that kind of comedy wrestling and the silliness and absurdity because, hey, it is – a show, so why not take it to the next level and just make it completely outlandish, I guess is the philosophy behind that. Uh, but just for me, and I hate to be that guy, I hate to be the bitter old fuck, but god damn it. Like, I hate that shit so fucking much. Like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, I, everybody knows it's bullshit, and I guess if the show you're on, like, if that's what they're doing... And that's what the people are paying tickets to see. I guess it's fine, but God damn it. Like the old veteran in me that, you know, is taught certain things about wrestling and certain rules that you follow to protect it and present it and make sure it's done in a way that is uh, palpable to people and appeals to people that will sell tickets. Like that's just polar opposite of everything I was taught. Yeah, I saw that. I watched it one time really briefly, and then I just I kept seeing it pop up. So I was like, oh, this thing's getting over. But um, I didn't rewatch it or look a lot into it. But, yeah, I don't like that stuff either. I think there's a way to do it's a comedy and stuff in wrestling, and it can be done properly and done with the right people. And not to say you wasn't the right person to do that, but... Uh, yeah, when you're having guys sell stuff, I don't know. There, There is a line, and uh, a lot of times it, it, people go over it now. But, you know, the, the, um, the toothpaste is so far out of the container that it's like, what can you not do, really? People know everything's bullshit. So if you're not in this heated match, if you're just in a random match and do it, um, I guess I could see the arguments be played. I don't really, I don't dig that stuff. You know, it's like a lot of... The the new thing with the uh, slow motion wrestling, it, it's funny, it's entertaining. The guys are clever that do it, but it's it's some stupid bullshit. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, it's the kind of shit that if I saw in a match on a show I was booking, like I would lose my shit. Um, like I said, if it's PWG or one of those like where they expect it, then whatever, you know, that's what the crowd wants. Give it to them, but on a traditional wrestling show. And, like, I don't know that those guys would try to do something like that, but I don't know. It's like two conflicting ideologies just fighting over one another. And, like I said, I just can't abandon my principles. I I think it's some bullshit. (laughs) Yeah, I I, I agree Um, 100%. I just think there's a, a, a way to do things, but... I think we're probably the kind of the minority these days, and most people just say, "Oh, it's wrestling; it doesn't matter." Which I, I, I just, I kind of hate that. I mean, there's a there's a time and place for that phrase. I mean, there's some things, but when you're just like, "Okay, well, it's just wrestling, so we don't have to put forth any effort or um, try to make this." Uh, a good show or better quality or an athletic contest. It's like, it's eye roll worthy at, uh, for sure. Yeah. But, and I can I mean, definitely see where like the old school guys just have a fucking coronary over that shit because you know, this, yeah. these guys, they, they lived and died for this shit. They, uh, it was their living. It was their lifestyle. Um, and, you know, a guy like Joey Ryan, he's a full-time wrestler, to my understanding. You know, he's between indies and TNA and different spots that he does here and there. You know, he tends to make a living. So good for him. 
you know, and good for him if he's finding an audience to buy it. But I ain't that audience, and the type of wrestling that I sell to people would not be that audience either. Yeah, but I think really it just boils down that you're better because your dick can't suplex anybody. <laughs> I, I suppose. <laughs> it may can belly to belly somebody. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. <laughs> <laughs> so the statute oh. of limitations has run out on that, so maybe one day I'll tell that story. <laughs> I love inside jokes, especially in a public forum such as a podcast. Our listeners are like, what the fuck are you talking about, you assholes? Let us know. I'll let you know (laughs) one day when we talk about uh, fuck or fail the ex-wife sedition. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's fucking funny. Spoiler alert, it was a fail. (laughs) It sure as shit was. (laughs) Oh oh man, I had a I had a little piece of news. This is a little piece of personal news, but I just uh, because I know we've discussed it lately. But um someone brought me a little treat from Starbucks. You know, I never had Starbucks, I'm not a coffee person. Yeah, I know we talked about this, and you mentioned you're a fan of some of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And I tried this. I tried this shit, and it was delicious. <laughs> what did you have? It was a vanilla bean frappuccino. I told you. <laughs> I mean, it was cold. Like I was, I was like, oh, oh, okay, this is a cold drink. All right, so. And I didn't know what the fuck it was. I was like, well, I guess I'll take a sip. And I drank that motherfucker in about 30 seconds. I don't know what size it was. It must not have been a vente or whatever, but it was gone. Yeah, I inhaled I those what motherfuckers. Think, I, think, I, I think I thought of that because I was going to ask, uh, you know, the holidays are coming up. Let's talk about the holidays a little bit more. Keep that thing going. We got a special thing coming up and a our next segment, and then I thought, oh, yeah, fucking Starbucks cups. That's the big news of the holidays. And just thought I would share that with you and our listeners, that I'm a I'm a fan of something at Starbucks. Now, I don't plan on going to buy that shit because I can't be getting hooked on no fucking $5 Frappuccinos. Because <laughs> I will. I don't fuck around. People ask me why I don't drink alcohol. That's fucking why. <laughs> I, can't, I can't just be sipping... Can't be sipping a beer like a normal person. I'd be fucking going crazy, getting hammered every night. (laughs) But you'll pay for him with dick all day long. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Oh, shit. Well, yeah, as Andrew mentioned, we do have uh, another playing favorites holiday edition for you this week as the holiday specials continue to roll on. We'll be back here just a little bit with Strong Style Psycho Tank as we talk our top three Christmas movies of all time. But before we do that, real quick, going to get the plugs out of the way. Uh, Empire Wrestling, huge fifth anniversary card. Going to be going down this Saturday night. Uh, It will have already happened as this airs, but definitely check out EmpireWrestling.net, Facebook.com slash Empire Wrestling, on Twitter at EmpirePW as things are moving forward to the huge Christmas night event, as well as long, cold winter. So tell us about a little more about what's going on at Empire. Man, that's uh, hopefully the fifth anniversary goes well. Like you said, it'll have already happened, but we're having the the first ever Empty Awards, uh, hosted by uh, Livewire Corey Cox, Mister Sports Entertainment, and the one and only Reverend Dan Wilson. Triple hosting <laughs> duties for the Empties. Uh, first award show, and I haven't gone all out trying to write scripts for, you know, an entire award show, but definitely throwing around some ideas for some silly, stupid jokes, as as we've all co- come to know from any award show, really. I did debate about just having cue cards and have having just, like, the worst jokes possible and having guys come out and read them, 
like really exciting individuals like Chris Gans or Lamar Phillips come out and just read cue cards of jokes. No <laughs> award show banter. <laughs> like, like it would be so ridiculous. Like people would get the nudge nudge that oh this is fucking stupid. <laughs> But I think the show, uh, yes, of course. I mean, I think I think bad comedy is good when you know it's bad comedy, <laughs> like when you're not trying to sell it as as genius stuff. When you're like, oh my god, this is so bad, we have to share it. But I think it'll go well. And then December nineteenth, we'll we'll have another event, and uh, that should be good. Working on a big main event for that. Hopefully. Uh, It'll be announced maybe by the time this airs, but I'm still trying to work out the the small details about it. And then Christmas night is, uh, is going to be a big deal. It's going to be on a Friday this year, so uh, it's going to work out perfect. Come after you open your presents and eat your eat all your food and your turkeys and your hams. Come to Empire, and then the next day you can rest and relax. You probably don't have to go to work the next day, so uh, it's going to be a good situation. And then we roll right in. To that new year, 2016. Looking forward to it. A lot of exciting stuff on the horizon for Empire Wrestling. Looking forward to the MP Awards, Christmas night, long cold winter, and so much more, as always, at the Empire Arena. 22 Austin Avenue, Rossville, Georgia. Check them out. Again, EmpireWrestling.net is the website. Home video release for Chasing the Grail is in production. We'll be out soon. We'll get a release date for you there. I have a couple of upcoming appearances myself outside of the Empire Arena, throwing on the old managerial robes to handle the strong style psychos tanks affairs afar. He asked me to join them on this journey to Cornelia, Georgia, back to one of our home bases, some old stomping grounds for Why We Wrestle's Heavyweight Championship Tournament, January 9th, 2016, at the famed Church of Southern Wrestling. Tank is going to be going one on one with Deathmatch Legend Masada. So you got two Deathmatch Legends going toe to toe to the baddest motherfuckers you ever met in your life, facing off at the Church of Southern Wrestling on January 9th. You want to be there. And also, we will be returning to Alabama to cause carnage, spill blood, and raise immortal hell in the month of March for New South Wrestling. So you want to check them out as well. Man, that that match with Masada, that's that's a that's kind of a must see. Like, and that one, I don't see there being a lot of rematches there. So that could be a one time only thing, uh, especially you know, one time in 2016, and and some years beyond. Uh, you know that that may be a match that just never happens again. So. Uh, I hope it's main event because if I was wrestling, I sure would not want to follow that one. <laughs> yeah, going to be hard to follow that. I don't know if there will be an arena left after that fight. Uh, they better nail everything down they can. I'll be there at ringside helping take strategize. I've called a lot of Masada's matches over the years, but I've never had to strategize against him. And you talk about a formidable opponent. Uh, this is going to be one of Tank's toughest fights to date, and uh, but he's very excited for it. He's up for the challenge because he only wants the best because you can't prove yourself to be the best unless you beat the best. And right now, in terms of that arena, in terms of deathmatch wrestling brawling, Masada is probably the top dog in the country right now. So it's going to be an honor, and it's going to be a motherfucking fight, folks. Fuck yeah. You handle this. You handle his affairs in the ring, and I handle his affairs outside of the ring, which means I, I try to convince him to cheat on his wife all the time because the ladies love Tank. <laughs> they do love him, but he's a motherfucking oak, let me tell you. Rejects honor their word, and they honor their bond. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't try to get him to cheat on his wife because his wife could fucking beat the living shit out of me, and him both. She could beat the shit out of all of us, so I would I would have no I would have no part in any of that action. But the ladies do love Tank. I'm sure a lot of the men love him too. He's quite the bear. <laughs> he is a poster child. That's a matter of fact. <laughs> Speaking of, 
We'll go to this little holiday cheer. Here's some spinal tap for you with Christmas with the devil. And we will be back on the Midnight Black Mass for the top three Christmas movies. Playing favorites coming at you. Ow! Don't go anywhere. Holiday special part three, and we have a very special segment for you here. We've uh, reflected on many different aspects and pieces of the holiday season over the last few weeks, but tonight we're talking about some of our favorite movies. Certainly a tradition amongst all families 
when this time of year comes, there's a lot of great movies. Uh, if you grew up in the 70s and 80s, you remember a lot of them airing on television. Uh, some of them still air on TV. Some of them now you own in your digital library. But everybody's got their set favorite number of Christmas movies. So we're going to count down our top three, talk about some of those. Back with the Rejects Family Roundtable. So you joined us for Thanksgiving dinner, and now you're joining us for the the pre-Christmas festivities as we're all sitting around getting hammered, enjoying the holiday season and, and each other's company. So, hell yeah, I'm ready to rock and roll with this. This is a favorite topic of mine. Andrew Alexander, our esteemed co-host, is on the panel and, of course, returning as always for these types of discussions, our dear friend, the strong style psycho Tank. So, gentlemen, take it away. Andrew, what do you got for number three? Well, I thought, let me start. I thought you I thought you were going to say we're going to reflect on our favorite assholes. You said, and, and I was like, I just thought that's where you were going. And I thought, well, who better to reflect with us than Tank? Because when you think <laughs> asshole, you got to think about that guy. Ho, 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 mofos. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so our top three favorite Christmas movies. Uh, this is a pretty tough choice. Uh, I didn't go with like any of the specials and the because usually those are kind of short, uh, even though they are classics and really need to be watched every Christmas. But my number three was a little tough, but I went with Home Alone. Uh, came out when I was a kid, you know, the right age <laughs> to really sink in to my mind. And I mean, I think it was just, I mean, it's a good flick. It's a good fun. Uh, Booby traps are always good. It's quotable. It's got some good lines, and uh, it barely nudged out uh, Santa Claus for uh, my number three spot. Home Alone. That's a good one. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, we. I just watched that like night before last. Does it hold up? I mean, last time I saw yeah, it. Yeah, I, I think so. I think yeah. so. Yeah, my my kid enjoyed it. Your kid's going to be sitting up all sorts of shit. You're going to be tripping and stumbling over. (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) But, you know, you can make a little kid laugh from a movie that's dated as hell like that. I mean, it's not really that dated. It it looks somewhat 90s, but, like, if you go back and watch it, like, they keep things pretty generalized. So the only things that really, like, super dated are uh, the corded telephones and shit like that. But they didn't, like, it's it's not like a period piece or nothing. Um Funny yeah. fucking movie, like a funny all-ages comedy, and that's something, me and my wife talked about this the other day, uh, you guys remember fucking good all-ages comedies, and I don't mean like, that doesn't mean that's just suitable for kids, it, all ages should mean something that all fucking ages can enjoy, and Home Alone is definitely that, um, not a lot of more children's geared movies are like that anymore. Yeah, it seems like they leave out the parents or teens and stuff with a uh, with a lot of that stuff. So if you're not four or five, you can't enjoy it. But uh, yeah, it was good. Had some sequels. I think part two was was good. It wasn't as good as the first, but part two held up. Uh, you know, lost in New York. After that, you know, you didn't have the original cast and things kind of went awry. But definitely those first two are awesome. Uh, last word on Home Alone, uh, unless Tank has anything to share. No, no, it was cool. You know, okay. Like you said, I, you know, they they show it every year, and then I'll sit back and kick back and watch it. And, and it's just some funny shit. Yeah, it's always funny to laugh at those assholes just bumbling around, you know, Daniel yeah. Stern and Joe Pesci are really great as the foils in that. Um, has anybody seen... The fucking Home Alone 2016 or 2015 video that they that like some comedy YouTube channel did. I can't think of the name of it to save my fucking life. But Macaulay Culkin, it's like this web series, right, where this guy is an Uber driver and he picks up like fucked up celebrities from the 80s and 90s and like they're what they're doing now. And uh, or maybe I have it backwards, but anyway. This guy, uh, he calls an Uber, and Macaulay Culkin is the fucking driver, and he's, like, all fucked up. <laughs> and so the guy that calls the Uber has to end up driving himself while Macaulay Culkin's in the back fucking smoking a cigarette and bitching about how he's, he says something about something being ice cold that his wife did to him. He goes, you want to hear about ice cold? My fucking mom left me at home for a goddamn week when I was eight. <laughs> <laughs> That's 
come. Yeah, yeah, it's, definitely, it's definitely reached that classic status where you can do some shit like that, and it's really, really entertaining and good to see. It kind of brings it back yeah. for, I think this is the 25th anniversary of when that came out. I believe it was a, a 1990 movie, so definitely it's going gonna, it's gonna to last. It's going to stand the test of time, I think. Yeah, check out that video on YouTube if you have it, and we're a hobo load fan. What you got for number three, Tank? Uh, my number three is Bad Santa. Oh, that's a good uh, one. Norton. The probably the rudest and crudest Santa you will ever see. Yeah, it was a. Uh, I think at the time it was like it held the record for the most uses of the word "fuck" ever in a movie. It may still hold the record. I don't know. But <laughs> it's it's pretty great, especially the little fat kid who with the snot nose and and made that something. Can I make you some sandwiches? <laughs> <laughs> uh I I'm pretty sure Wolf of Wall Street surely beat the the record with the with the word fuck, but yeah, that's one I didn't even think about. I just kinda thought of the family wholesome movies. But that that's a really good movie. I remember seeing previews and just kind of being like well that might be okay but that's just kind of maybe a silly print a premise but i went and watched it man and i love that movie i own it for sure like that's a that's an awesome it's funny as fuck it's got it's got a good little meeting that you can learn from good good moral uh moral story but it, it's hilarious oh my god yeah, yeah that is a the, great the, movie the fucking kid you know with the snot nose He's like, what are you going for Christmas, a tissue? I mean, that's just funny as hell. <laughs> <laughs> What's your goddamn obsession with asking me if I want a fucking sandwich? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's great. And the chick that's like, oh, fuck me Santa, fuck me Santa. <laughs> <laughs> Which is that's the mom of the Gilmore Girls. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> then I fuck me Lauren Santa, which is great. <laughs> And then, yeah. you know, uh, fucking Bernie Mac and then the little midget dude that's been in, like, a shit ton of movies. Or little person dude, whatever the hell you want to call him. <laughs> yeah, I can't remember his name, but he's in a ton of shit. He, he's hilarious in it. Yeah, it's it, it's all around awesome. Great choice, man. Like, it's a great fucking movie. Like, it's not just a good... Like, it's just a great movie. Like, it has a great story. Like, the fucking ending is so fucking great. Like, I mean, it's, it's like, heartwarming and funny as fuck. And, like, it, it just strikes on all the chords. I love Bad Santa. What a great fucking pick. So, I got a quick question. I got a quick question sure. for Tank. Have you ever... Uh... Have you ever have you ever felt the need to dress up in Santa? Maybe sneak in at night, you know, surprise the wife, take what's yours a little bit. Maybe she'll be screaming, <laughs> "Fuck me, Santa!" Nah, shit. She'd just be like, "What the fuck you doing? Get out of here!" <laughs> <laughs> but the, yeah, if I was do, a bitch shit like that, she would just be like, "All right, you're stupid. You get Go down to play drunk. games." You get her a little drunk, and then you come in as Santa, and the next morning when she asks you about it, you just act like you have no fucking clue what she's talking about <laughs> and convince her to the point where she starts questioning, did I fuck a complete stranger on Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. Oh, fuck. Well, uh, I, I guess I'll give my number three then if we don't have anything else to say about Bad Santa. Uh, my number three would be the horror classic Silent Night, Deadly Night. Uh, it's about a young man who grows up in an orphanage. Uh, he fucking hates Santa Claus. Like, some traumatic shit happens to him when he's a kid. Uh, he's, like, fucking a little deranged and ends up, when he grows up, becoming a fucking... <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a Catholic boy's home that he grows up in. It's like the fucking nuns are always beating him and shit and held him. They're goddamn naughty. And then saying not going to fucking visit him. So when he grows up, he becomes a deranged maniac who dresses in a fucking Santa suit and comes into people's houses on Christmas Eve and fucking murders them. So uh, <laughs> Silent Night, Deadly Night is a classic. If you haven't seen it, it's worth the line for 
a fucking maniac with an axe and a Santa costume chasing these chicks around, just going, naughty, 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 naughty. <laughs> Is that the one where he uh, he picks a chick up and impels her on the fucking horns over like yes. a fireplace? No, yes. Okay. I know that might be Black Christmas, actually. No, no, I it's Harlem Night, Deadly Night. Okay. I don't think he just made Black Christmas anymore. I don't think that's PC. <laughs> what was the? <laughs> I know there was a, like a Wonder Ring Santa that had Goldberg in it. What the hell was that? Uh, Santa's was it like sleigh. a remake of that or something? No, it was just fucking awful. Oh God, that movie was so <laughs> terrible. It's really fucked up too. Like, like the story of it is like Santa's really like a fucking demon, and so like uh, he's like really supposed to be Santa Claus, but it's like the myth is that that Santa's a demon from hell that comes to kind of like the Krampus, I guess now, which is gaining popularity. But. Uh, so and so when Santa came to town, he just fucking killed people <laughs> instead, and that was kind of the deal with that. Uh, I, I I've seen Silent Night, Deadly Night, but it was when I was a kid. Like I really can't remember anything about it. That's that's one I should I should try to go back and rewatch. Uh, well, now that y'all spoiled my number two, talking about uh, Goldberg and Santa, I can't even talk about it because that was my number two pick. Oh, no God. shit! <laughs> I'm just well, no, go ahead and share your no, thoughts, just, please. The world I'm, wants to know. No, I'm just kidding. I've never seen that movie. I remember it, but I it I have no interest in watching that. It looks like a piece of shit. But um, <laughs> my number two pick and my number one pick, they're tough, man. They are close. Like you could ask me tomorrow, and I might change my mind. Uh, it really just depends. They're both just so great and so iconic. I'm I'm gonna give I'm gonna give number one the edge just because of my mood, but number two I'm gonna go with a Christmas story. Uh, obviously a classic, everyone's seen it. They play it for 24 hours straight, which is great because it's the type of movie where you can catch the last 30 minutes and then catch like the middle part of it, and then maybe go back and watch the first part and just piece it together in your mind, and it still just works. You don't have to see it start to finish. But what a great fucking movie and great story and so many great lines that you can quote and that just everyone knows. Uh, so I gave it the number two nod. That's, I mean, yeah, there's not very many Christmas movies better than that. I don't think I put it on my list intentionally because I figured it would come up. So I, I tried to pick some things that I thought you guys might not pick uh, just for the sake of discussion. Uh, but God damn it, yeah, how could that not be at the top of anybody's list? Uh, so many great performances. Darren McGavin steals the movie for me, Kolchak the Night Stalker, as the father of young Ralphie, uh, <laughs> with his fucking various one-liners and shit. Uh, that he, <laughs> he worked in profanities like some painters worked in oils. <laughs> Fragilely. The goddamn lamp. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to ask, ask you what's your what's your favorite line or scene from a Christmas story? The number one that sticks out. Man, mine. I mean, there's there's so many good ones. One of my favorites is when the goddamn dogs bum rush the house <laughs> and they eat the turkey, and he closes the door, and that fucker's ear is stuck in the door. He's like, compasses. <laughs> oh shit, that's a good one. Um, my favorite scene? God damn it, there's so many, but they all involve Darren McGavin. I, I'd say after she breaks the fucking lamp, and she's trying to put it back together, and he's like, "You use up all the glue," <laughs> <laughs> and then like he's, he's like. Get ready to go to the store, and he's trying to think of something nasty to say to her, and all that comes out is not a finger. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's uh, my favorite scene. <laughs> obviously, um, I love. I mean, you shoot your you'll shoot your eye out, classic, and I love for Geely. I mean, it can be the middle of fucking July, and if I see something with fragile on it, I'm like, <laughs> Fragili, <laughs> it must be Italian. 
But uh, I really love the scene where he's trying to change the tire, and he drops the he drops the shit, and he goes, "Oh, fudge!" And he's yeah. like, "But I didn't say fudge. What did you say?" <laughs> That's what I thought you said. Get back in the car. And he's scared to death. And then the mom goes home and he finds out he he lies on his friend and says he heard it from him and he calls the mom. <laughs> and you hear the mom beat the shit out of the little kid in the background. It's great. <laughs> so what I do, mom, what I do. <laughs> oh, mom, what I do. Go on. <laughs> I mean, I also I also like it, you know, when they go to the Chinese restaurant and they're singing, you know, fa ra 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 and they cut the goddamn head off that duck. And they're like, oh, shit. Yeah, there's just so much. Oh, man. That was on my list. Now I'm going to have to change some shit around. Yeah, that <laughs> no. <was. laughs> we can talk about it more. We can talk about that movie the whole show, I'm sure. I mean, it's just. Right, well, let's just say that's my number two also. So yeah, let's just keep talking about it because there's so much funny shit in it. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, you know, the fucking kid sticking his tongue to the goddamn cold pole. He's just stuck. Yeah, and and like all of these scenes are just. I mean, a, a lot of movies have one, two, three iconic scenes. This one, I mean, it probably has ten. Like the whole movie is just jam packed with iconic shit that you just remember and you think about and you can just quote word for word. And, and when he, he waits in that long ass line to see Santa and he can't talk and he goes down that slide and starts climbing back up and Santa's just like, you'll shoot your eye out, kid. And he steps on his face. It's like The maniacal, evil looking Santa. Like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, when he's standing in the line, that little goofy kid with the fucking aviator helmet on and the glasses, like uh, talking about the, the Tin Man, my favorite character. <laughs> talking about the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> Ralph is like, who the fuck are you? Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and his, bro- uh, his brother with the coat, he can't put his arms up. I can't put, I can't move my arms. <laughs> oh, Brandy is great all throughout the movie. That, that, I can't get up. I can't get up. And fucking, uh, like when he hides in the fucking cabinet after Ralphie gets in the fight with the fucking bully, and he's like, Daddy's gonna kill Ralphie. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, uh, somebody's want to eat his food, and she goes, be my little piggy. <laughs> When he beats the shit out of the kid. Oh, yeah, when he beats the shit out of that kid. Scott Vargas, and he's like, and all I saw was his beady eyes and his yellow teeth. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, beating the hell out of Scott Vargas was was fucking great. Like, that's one of the great bully comeuppance scenes in all of film. No, for sure. It's got to be the best. <laughs> Fucking classic. Ah, uh, shit. Well, number two, fuck. Um, Christmas Story, you know, like I said, I, I kind of left it off the list intentionally because I figured we'd talk about it plenty. So, for my number two, not very, not really a great film in retrospect, but the nostalgia is just so fucking heavy. And there's all, it's like a Christmas story. So many fucking lines, especially if you're a redneck. If you grew up from up north and you're not familiar with our southern customs, this one may not be a favorite of yours. But it will always be a favorite of mine, and that is motherfucking Ernest Saves Christmas. <laughs> God damn <laughs> I'll be the first to admit it. I didn't. I never watched any of those goddamn Ernest movies, so I never saw it. But y'all can go ahead and give me a a good synopsis on it here. Oh, well, you well, saw I, it. I mean, Ernest, you know the deal with him, right? Oh, go ahead, Eddie. Yeah. No, I was just going to say that I think that one I've probably I, I've probably seen little bits and pieces, like not even enough to. I know that I've just you see it on flipping through the channels. But I, I can't, I've never even seen it either, like, start to finish to even talk about it. I mean, I'm very familiar with the movie, but I just never saw it. So it, it's definitely a good pick. I'm interested to hear some of the funny shit. 
Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just stupid. I mean, like, like, it's not a great movie, but it has a lot of great scenes in it. And Ernest is just such a lovable idiot. And really, in that whole series of movies, Dad and Ernest Goes to Camp were really the only ones that were decent. The rest of them all kind of sucked. But the first two, that was the second one of the Ernest series. The first was Ernest Goes to Camp, which was very popular. Um, he was a character that uh, I believe he originated on Hee Haw, played by actor Jim Varney. So he's very folksy and southern. He's a lovable idiot. The movie starts out where Ernest is a fucking fuck-up cab driver who, uh, because it's Christmas, he keeps giving people free cab rides because he feels sorry for them. So he gets fired by his boss. So one of the people he gives a cab ride to claims he's fucking Santa Claus. <laughs> and so... Uh, he he has to he, he drops the guy off at his stop and shit ends up getting fired meets back up with Santa anyway the the guy that claims he's Santa is like this fucking old dude basically his power is running out and he's got to find a new Santa Claus to transfer the power to because he's getting fucking old he's like eight hundred years old or some shit so he finds this te- children children's television host in Florida where they are uh, who's the uh, great with kids or whatever and he wants to transfer the power to him but the guy's like not having it. And he's got a Hollywood agent who's, like, trying to transition him from children's shows into being a movie star. So he's going to put him in this horror movie called uh, Christmas Slay, actually. That's, like, where, you know, about some fucking alien disguised as a Santa Claus and murders people. And, like, he's he has a moral dilemma because he's a kid's host and shit, and Santa Claus is trying to convince him. Well, anyway, they all think the Santa Claus guy's crazy, so they fucking go lock him up. <laughs> and Ernest ends up bailing him out. and um. The funny shit is just Ernest being a fucking idiot, like, uh, singing Oh Christmas Tree, but forgetting the fucking words. So it's just like, uh, Oh Christmas Tree, Oh Christmas Tree, Oh Christmas Tree, Oh Christmas Tree. <laughs> fucking... <laughs> and fucking, when he goes over to his buddy's Vern, buddy Vern's house and just fucking destroys it, like, he's got this, like, classic, nice, uh, suburban Christmas party on it, and then Ernest goes in there and just fucking like, trying to help and just fucking destroys everything. Like, it's silly, folksy comedy, but uh, it, it always appeals to me because it's very down-home and southern. Um, my favorite scene from the movie is when they're trying to get onto the Hollywood movie set to convince this Joker Others guy at the last second that he's really got to become Santa or Santa will die forever. Uh, like, Ernest disguises himself as a fucking snake handler. <laughs> And throws Santa Claus in the back of his fucking van or the back of his truck in a trash bag and, like, has him, like, wiggle around like he's a bag of snakes. <laughs> so it's like the impersonation that he does when he's the fucking snake handler. He's like, hey, you can't go get one of them snakes now. They're pausing. Don't touch it. They're pausing. You want one for your boy? I give one to my boy once. And then he puts his hand over his heart like... Burr, burr, burr. <laughs> this is fucking stupid. If you like Hee Haw, you like Ernest Goes to Fucking Saves Christmas. If you don't like Hee Haw, then you probably won't. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly sounds ridiculous. Like, I don't even know. Some of these movie premises, I don't even understand how people sit around and come up with. I think they're just drunk and throwing out ideas. They're like, yeah, that works. It's Ernest. We can do whatever we want. Nobody's going to give a fuck. Oh, and then the fat dude from fucking Hee Haw, uh, Gaylord Sartain, <laughs> the dude that does the fucking eye gimmick where, like, he, you know, shake his eyes back and forth. Uh, yeah. He's really fucking funny in that. He plays an air traffic controller with his buddy Bobby, who's like this little fucking emaciated motherfucker with a giant nose and no teeth. And uh, they the fucking reindeer get shipped there, and, like, they fucking let them out of the box, and they, like, magnetize to the ceiling and shit. It's just fucking dumb as fuck, but it's funny. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds ridiculous. I would probably love it if I ever watched it. Yeah, you probably would. (laughs) Yeah, I may have to to check that one out, see if it's it's on any streaming sites or anything. It's Uh, on Netflix right now. My number one, I I have a feeling it's Tank's number one. I think it'd be hilarious if it if it was your number one as well. Uh, like I said, Christmas Story could be interchangeable for sure, but I always <laughs> lean a little towards National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. God damn, oh, yeah, I know it. <laughs> That's Tank's number one as well. I yeah. figured it was. But that movie, 
It, and you know, and it's not it's not that old. It came out in the the, the very late eighties, I believe, uh, maybe eighty nine, eighty eight, eighty nine. But it's <laughs> it's just so. I mean, it's fa- it's my favorite of the vacation movies, uh, kind of by leaps and bounds. Like I think it's just a, a lot better than those, uh, the than the others. And I just man, I love this fucking movie. It's got so many good lines, so many good scenes. It's like. He he plays that type of dad so well. Uh, he's just bending his, breaking his back to make Christmas just this epic thing, and the, your whole fucking family arrives. And <laughs> oh my god, it's, oh it's just so funny. The goddamn yeah, it, uh, the goddamn tree when he cuts it open and just busts out all the windows and shit. Or, uh, yeah, the neighbor's house. They're like, what the hell? And he, when he cuts the lights on, and it's just like, <laughs> like <laughs> his neighbors is like, oh shit, they couldn't fucking see. And of course, you know the fucking his cousin Eddie shit her soul, Clark. Goddamn. <laughs> and and the radiation <laughs> shit that is coming out of, out of the RV. <laughs> this is like one of those movies you can watch like any time of the year. Just yeah. to get a good laugh. You know, it's it can be fucking June. Oh hell, I'm gonna watch something funny. Just put that shit in. Do you think yeah. Shooter's Full is the is the single best line from the movie? <laughs> that and then uh, I I mean I I don't know it all by in my head, but when Clark when he gets that guy down, uh, he gets this fucking little Christmas club gift. It's like the fucking the jelly of the of the month or whatever. <laughs> he just goes on that little rant. And, and talks about that goddamn little licking thing. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit! Where's the aspirin? <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah! Holy shit! <laughs> that would be Both. that would be a great that would be a great rant to learn word for word and just break out somewhere and you know half the people you can do it in a public place and half the people would get it and then the other half would be like. Holy shit, this guy's freaking out. <laughs> <laughs> the fucking old grandma that, that fucking puts the cat in the goddamn box. <laughs> Wraps the cat up and and then he eats the fucking electrical cord and fucking explodes. <laughs> fucking <laughs> fucking snot. What's the dog's name? Snot? Now snot, go yeah. over and let Uncle Clark rub your belly. <laughs> you ever seen a set like that on a dog before? <laughs> <laughs> I, and I love fucking. Would you like to say Grace? Grace. Oh, <laughs> she died. The blessing. The blessing. <laughs> and, then, and she breaks into the damn pledge of allegiance, and everybody just stands up and goes with it. It's so <laughs> that's another one. It can be. It can be the middle of summer, and I hear somebody's like, "Would you like to say Grace?" I just want to go. The blessing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they cut man. They dry when they when they cut it and it just splits open, and they're just, the way they're just gnawing on it. <laughs> <laughs> the the green gelatin with the cat food. Come on, man. <laughs> <That's good shit. laughs> Oh, dude, yeah. That it, like, if I was really picking a number one instead of trying to have a good discussion with different shit. The, obviously, that's number one. I mean, we were watching that in the hospital at the time that uh, we were waiting on my little girl to be born. You know, <laughs> like, it's one of those essential movies you carry with you during the holiday season. Uh, and so much good shit. God damn it. Like, and, and like Cousin Eddie is one of the great characters as well. He's <laughs> like, he has so many good lines. Uh, oh, this is just a real nice surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Here, get my, yourself something my, a real nice. My favorite part is still when they're fucking going sweating and uh, Clark sprays that shit on the bottom of that little sled. And he just like hauls ass like a fucking, like a bullet being shot out of a gun. And he's just going like through Walmart and shit. Oh, man. I, I laugh every fucking time at that. I'm about to put that shit on right now, son. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll probably have to watch that when... Uh... I do have that one on on DVD here, and uh, I, Dan just mentioned, but that's another line that I use all the time, and p- 
people just because it's I don't use it in the same context. I'll just use it any time I can say the words real nice, and people don't. <laughs> They're like, what the? They give you that look, like, okay. But I'm just like, it's something real nice. <laughs> I, I I always tell my wife every time we go somewhere that's like more of an upper class function, like some of her work events and shit, where I have to dress up and you know, like fucking look presentable. I was like, I feel like fucking cousin Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I don't know if you've ever been somewhere where you felt a little out of place. To me, I, it always makes me feel like Cousin A. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely going to have to watch that shit. And I, it's a little off topic, but uh, I just recently uh, checked out the new Vacation movie. And uh, Tank, didn't you see that in the theater? No, I never saw it. Oh, oh you got to rent it, man. It's pretty fucking good. Like, it's got some funny yeah. shit. I'm not saying it's on the level of Christmas Vacation, but it's definitely worth a watch. It's it's got some. I mean, it was much funnier than I thought it would be. I just thought it would. They'd kind of phone it in, man. But it's got some really good shit. Yeah, yeah I, I, I haven't seen it either. Yeah, it's in yeah, it's man. in the old red box. Definitely. Oh, oh, well. You guys have set the plate pretty high for number one, and I could just probably go on some more about Christmas Vacation, but um, I definitely had a different number one pick. Just watched it last week to make sure. I I thought about putting this on my list as number one for a while, but definitely holds up. Definitely one of the greatest horror or Christmas movies ever, in my opinion, Um, and it is somewhat of an all-ages movie. I mean, it has some brutal shit in it. But uh, fucking Gremlins, man. Gremlins is so oh, fucking shit. good. Like, oh, my God. Like, with the fucking practical effects and shit of that, like, all of the fucking monsters look real. You never, like, the only scene that looks kind of wonky is, like, when Spike leads all the fucking uh, Gremlins out onto the fucking street and they use, like, some stop motion shit and that kind of looks dumb. Yeah. But, like, other than that, dude, like, the fucking puppets and shit that they use, like great story, great moral, like fucking. That's such a classic fucking movie. It, it is always going to be up there on my top list. Yeah, it's awesome. awesome. I just uh, I bought it. I bought it a couple months ago. I had to break down. I was like, I need to get that. Now I almost had it number one. I really debated putting Gremlins two, but it's not so much as Christmas because that's a classic. <laughs> <laughs> Now, here's a it's a classic for different reasons. Or... I was reading, are we remaking Gremlins or doing another sequel or something? I've heard there's talks about it, yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, you know, the fucking, like, like for the movie, the, the old chick that played Flo in uh, the old Alice TV series, you know, she's just an old ruthless mean bitch, and she's got that goddamn chair that goes up the steps. And so oh, yeah. They just fuck her up. You know? <laughs> Mrs. Deagle it was a bitch. <laughs> she got what was coming to her. <laughs> yeah, that's, and that's, like, that's oh. for sure. And, and a lot of people don't even, I don't think people think of it as a Christmas movie. I think it just, I, I think there's some people that lean it more towards horror movie and more people just kind of don't even factored into maybe either spot, but yeah, definitely, definitely Christmas flick, it's a Christmas kiss he gets, and he, of course, breaks all the rules, uh, there's only a couple simple rules, and of course, the idiot just breaks them all, and man, this happens, but, uh, and Gizmo, man, I mean, he's like the, who wouldn't want a Gizmo, it's just the cutest fucking thing ever. Hell yeah. Yeah, he's laying there in the bed and watches fucking like racing movies and war movies and his like mammoth and shit. Like, oh, Gizmo's fucking great. Like the the puppeteering and the, the voice actors and shit that made that thing come to life were amazing. Because like the thing, he's so charming. You feel so bad for him when he gets fucked up, and then you know, like he's trying to do the right thing, and the other ones are all little shitheads. <laughs> and you know, of course, they if I could unplug the phone so he can feed him after or the uh, the alarm clock or they cut the cord. They can feed him after midnight, and then they turn into fucking gremlins. And how brutal is the fucking scene when they attack Billy's mom? 
and she fucks up like five gremlins in her fucking kitchen. Like she fucking puts that one's head in the fucking blender and fucks it up, and then throws another one in the goddamn microwave, and it explodes. And fucking... Yeah, man, that's good shit. What the hell went wrong with gremlins too? Like, what were they thinking? Because that thing's just like all over the place ridiculous. Has a great cameo by Hulk Hogan. Oh, it's a cartoon, man. Like, well, the first movie was, like, had legitimately scary moments and was, like, a really good moral tale of a once-off story. And then Gremlins 2 is like, okay, let's cash in on this as much as we can. Like, how many different Gremlins can we have that we can sell a fucking action figure of? Because they had every (laughs) kind of fucking Gremlin you could imagine in Gremlins 2. Yeah, they even had the... the, uh... <laughs> the, the chick, the, she looked like a damn hooker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That was uh, it was ridiculous. But Gremlins one holds up. It's definitely if if no one if people out there haven't seen it, it's you got to watch that for sure. Uh, any honorable mentions? I know Dan, you you kind of altered your list for the topic, and I mentioned Santa Claus. I think Santa Claus are, Santa Claus is only about twenty years old now, but I think that was a great movie with uh, Tim Allen. The, the original, the first one was really good. Uh, oh, yeah, that was, I always liked it. Yeah, I had a question for you guys, though. Like, you know, everybody talks about, like, Die Hard. Is that a Christmas movie? I mean, you know, yeah. It, it The whole thing takes place on Christmas, so I, it has to be a Christmas movie. Uh, yeah. I, mean, I, I was going to put that so. on there, but I was like, well, you know, I don't know if it's real. You know the holiday gimmick or whatever. You know, but, you know, but Die Hard's a badass fucking flick. I mean, if yeah, a that's motherfucker, one I think of. yeah, if a motherfucker comes down an elevator as a corpse with a Santa Claus hat, and somebody wrote, "I have a machine gun and blood on his shirt," <laughs> that's a Christmas movie. <laughs> like fucking. <laughs> but I remember, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit older than you guys. There was always this one little Christmas special that came on HBO when I was kid called Emmett Otter and the Jug Band Christmas. Oh, yes. And, oh, you know what I'm talking about? Yes, it's uh, Jim Henson. The thing. It's fucking great. Yeah, that, shit, that shit is great. And <laughs> I've I, never I heard it, of this at all. I found it at Walmart for like five bucks a few years ago when Kirsten, my oldest daughter, was younger. I put it in. I was so excited to watch it. And she looked at me and was like, this is terrible. And went to her <laughs> bedroom. I was like, that's blasphemy. <laughs> Yeah, yeah these kids these shit. days, man. No, yeah. they no good shit. Yeah, no. Emmett Otter, man. That was the fucking, uh, the, um, <laughs> his little band or whatever. His mom's got a fucking, uh, this big brown, no, what the hell you call it? It wasn't a washboard, but, uh, something that she washes the clothes in. Well, he got that knocks a hole in it. To make a fucking uh, like a one string guitar out of it. <laughs> oh, you know, you know something we didn't mention that I kind of forgot that would def. I mean, if we did a top five, I'd have to put it in there. I can't believe I forgot it. But Scrooge with Bill oh, Murray, yeah, that's a great fucking movie in general, <laughs> but a great Christmas movie. Yeah, I forgot all about that. One of the great variations on the Charles Dickens classic, though not my favorite. And y'all are gonna fucking laugh at me when you tell when I tell you which one my favorite uh, Christmas Carol version is. What is? But it? there ain't a better one than fucking Mickey's Christmas Carol. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 Goofy as Jacob Marley is fucking too much, man. Like fucking come on. You'll wear these chains for eternity. <laughs> 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 That's pretty fucking good. <laughs> I mean, there's there tons of good stuff. They're like, you know, just a, a Charlie Brown Christmas. You know, they got them little bitty ass Christmas tree. Yeah. Oh yeah, Charlie Brown tree. Beautiful yeah. looking. What about Santa with muscles? You know, nobody mentioned that shit. Uh, you know, <laughs> I never saw that. Never saw it either. I would say it was goddamn <laughs> terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. sure. What, what's the uh, what's the jingle all the way with Schwarzenegger? That was a good movie. Yeah, that's 
Yeah, it's kind of made its way into the Christmas canon as a, a true classic, and it was like late '90s, early 2000s. But yeah, no, that movie's funny as hell. I mean, anytime you got Schwarzenegger as the fucking dad chasing after the elusive Christmas gift, like oh, I've got to find the what was it like Johnny Rocket or something was the fucking name. No, of I think it, it what Turbo Man, Turbo Man. Yes, Turbo Man. I got to find the Turbo Man. <laughs> 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 and Sinbad, and uh, I think uh, I think Big Show's in that movie, ain't he? Yes. Yeah, I thought so. I haven't seen it in a while. I just wanted to go back and watch. So definitely a great. Uh, it's it's the season that gets the most play as far as uh, specials and movies and everything, because you know you got the time to sit around with the family, I guess. But uh, it definitely definitely first place in that for sure. No close second, but t- tons of great know. shit. Another one I wasn't a fan of, but a lot of people, you know, they, they popped for it and marched for it, was that A Nightmare Before Christmas. Oh, I, yeah, I, it's I don't good. Like that. I, it's, I, don't, I like I it. Never, never got into it. I, I think yeah, it's, I find it, it, it more of a Halloween movie than a Christmas movie, really, myself, but yeah, that's just me. <laughs> I remember Raven you know, had, came out to the, the theme to that in WCW. <laughs> or the remember the baby of these generic scenes of shit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I didn't even man, I never even realized that. That's hilarious. <laughs> I didn't either. I, I yeah, I mean but I I definitely hear it now. So <laughs> That's what I always thought it was. I was like, Well damn, that's just the generic version of the this is Halloween song. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good oh, time. Well, Guys, looks like we're about out of time, but this has been a lively and enjoyable discussion and become an annual tradition here on the Midnight oh, yes. Black Mass. So, anyway, uh, Tank, thanks for joining us, brother. As always, we no always problem. enjoy having you here. And Andrew, thanks for great episode me. once again. Always, thanks always. For, Good times. Good times. Hell yeah. Well, from the Rejects family to yours, we wish you a very Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, uh, whatever you fucking celebrate, do it right. Festivus. If you're going to drink or do drugs, do it on the holidays. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> so, thank you for joining us, folks. Keep one foot in the gutter, one fist in the gold. Good night. This has been a production of the Potty Humor Network. Find us online at youtube.com slash potty humor or subscribe to us weekly and never miss an episode by searching potty humor on iTunes or Stitcher. Thank you for listening and good night.